religion, we feel suffocation, right? Now, in the spiritual life, what you are saying is, is that feeling of the suffocation. Where, where, is, where, is, where is this oxygen? I am dying. But there are people who have died. Mm. They don't need oxygen, spiritual oxygen anymore. So they are caught in their, in their own, own things, like the stones and other things. Their spiritual life has come to, to such a low, and it never really dies completely because that is the human condition. But it comes to such low level of uh, consciousness that they are they are not aware that they are suffocating. Now, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that's the beauty of the human condition. When He made the human beings, when He made, made us as a, as a species, He made us ages. Yani ya mashal jinni walinsi ni sataat man tan fuzu min aktari samawati waladi fan fuzu. La tan fuzuna illa bi sultan. Oh, the gathering of the jinn and the insan. If you want to get out of the boundaries of the universe of the cosmos, which also is interpreted as the boundaries of the of the condition of the living human condition, you will not be able to go. So even for those people, there comes a moment, and this is sealed. There is no escape from death for anyone. There is not a single human being who is going to live forever. When these people who are spiritually dead they do experience at one time or other during their life on this earth that moment of terror where they know this all of this is going to come to an end like physically and this is the marakabat al-maut which of which i want to talk about in the last day of uh, our cures for this correction you physically emotionally spiritually put yourself in the grave you experience that moment of death, of total disappearance, departure from this earth, then you know the reality. So the realities are so strong that these people who are living a life of spiritual barrenness, like in a desert without any spiritual oxygen, even they are going to face that. So, the, you know, it's, it's a question of waking up now or then when there will be no time left for the, for, for the thing. So the built into the human condition, uh, into the very construction of our, our, of our coming and going on this planet, is this wake-up call uh, for everyone there who has come uh, on this earth. And uh, this is such, this is like a hammer, you know, where you wake up and this happens to everyone, no matter how forgetful, even to the Fir'aun, which is the thinner, Tyrant par excellence, like that's the prototype of tyranny. Um, when he was he was um, drowning, what did he say? He said, "I believe, I believe in the in the Rabb of Musa and Musa and Harun." And these are not fairy tales. These are the Quran does not have theoretical knowledge, and even though some people can choose not to believe. In the, in the revealed text, that's their choice. But what the Quran deals with is our realities which, which are like non-escapable. This is not theoretical discussion. This is reality. And reality has a force of its own. When the sun comes out, it has a force of its own. It does not need to insist, people, I am here, I have come. It doesn't need to say that. It just is. So is the truth. Wait, could I have one more question? Because uh, I want the lecture to continue as well at the same time. Yeah, or one or two. Okay, go on. Go um, uh, thank you. I, I just, I guess it's sort of a question uh, slash comment. I've, um, my sense is that there's a, a kind of, a, a microphone, sorry, okay, a kind of um, non-belief that's not being part of this conversation that perhaps should be. Um, and... And that is the one that it's not a question of, of rejecting the existence of God or denying the creator, because obviously we are, or it's, it's also not a question of, of uh, what I can also very much relate to leading a kind of superficial existence and not caring. Uh, but there's a kind of non-belief that I think has precedence within religious traditions, and that is actually engaging with religious thought, um, at pursuing truth, and then deciding that the answers that are given by the religious tradition are not adequate. And certain examples of that within religious traditions would be the Book of Job. Now, I know at the end, there is a turn back towards God. But for many, that has, uh, I think, inspired many um, 
thinkers, both within religious traditions and in the secular world, as an example of a kind of provisional, um, ethical, or um, reflexive, uh, uh, spiritual, I would even you could say, rejection of a religious tradition to an extent. Um, in, the, in the Christian tradition, there's um, the famous uh, Dostoevsky, the Brothers Karamazov. Um, it, it really, the, this conversation in the Brothers Karamazov resolves, revolves around the problem of evil. And Dostoevsky himself was very deeply a believing Christian. But his protagonist um, says, uh, he, there's a famous conversation at the center of the book where he says that because of the suffering of innocent children, he, the, the phrase he uses is that he gives back, I give back my ticket. He, he doesn't accept that an ethical uh, God would create a world where innocent children suffer. Uh, now, he may acknowledge that that exists. I mean, this is the world we exist. It's not that God, there is no God. It's that the God who created that world cannot be worthy of being worshipped, right? And, so, and that's, and in, but in fact, the author who, who, who gave voice to that perspective was himself Christian. Um, so, I mean, I just, I just think that that's, it, it's not, um, for me, I mean, I think the most, Consequential forms of non-belief are not the, the, are not the rejection or not not the denial of truth, but the sense that the truths that are given are not do not satisfy the highest ethical standards. And I mean, it really is the problem of evil. I think that everything goes back to. Yeah. Can, can I intervene? Mm -hmm. But this is a very racist approach to religion. You, you racist? argue racist, yes, because you're arguing from a position when you you know return the ticket. I don't think Dostoevsky meant what you mean. Racism? I mean, because yeah, what you're referring to, the book of Job, Dostoevsky, that's a discussion within religion. Yes. So disbelief, what you're talking about, is produced from within a religious, re religious milieu. You cannot assume a position, neither in the book of Job nor in Dostoevsky, of an external observer. You cannot be external to the debate. You cannot return the ticket. That's the argument Dostoevsky in the book of Job makes. Okay, you take out you know, God from the book of Job, there will be no more ethics. Okay, there'll be nothing. What you're arguing, I mean, it's a, it's a liberal position that you can step outside and you're smart enough and you're progressed enough, you know, you're developed enough that, that religion do doesn't matter. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, I mean... <laughs> no, alhamdulillah. <there's, laughs> I, I, uh, and, but this doesn't mean that there cannot be a discussion about belief or disbelief within the religion. And religion does produce disbelief, a form of disbelief. But, it, but it, it is a product of religion, okay? You cannot step outside. There's no stepping outside. Um, thank you to both of you. And uh, in fact, it, it is my desire to engage more deeply with this position because uh, uh, out of seven billion human beings now living on planet, planet Earth, um, on the spectrum that I mentioned from one end to the other end, this position uh, is quite substantial in numbers. Uh, what you call, very rightly said that uh, uh, this is a liberal, well thought of uh, sort of position to, to step outside. Uh, that the answers, people who search answers and they don't find satisfactory answers uh, given to them, and then they decide that no religion is adequate enough for the times in which we are living. Therefore, it is better to pursue what we ourselves have reached through deliberate interaction with the religious traditions now existing on earth, none of them being satisfactory, and therefore we car our own way. And we, most of these people are ethical. They, their behavior is good. Their interactions with other people are good, and they're morals are good, they, they treat each other, other human beings and their own interactions with the world are very ethical, they care for the environment and they, they are. So what is the problem with, with that approach? I want to do, I do want to engage and also thank you for bringing uh, Brothers Kamazov. The, the position that you are talking about is actually, of course this is the heart of the novel, heart of the story, is actually the dialogue between Ivan Kamazov the eldest brother who, who, who has gone to the, who has, who has reached this conclusion himself to return the ticket, and the younger, youngest brother, Alusha, who is the innocent. 
uh, and uh, at one time I was deeply into Dostoevsky. So I, I do believe that uh, he does. He did have a spiritual crisis as well, believing Christian as he, as he was. He went through a very deep personal spiritual crisis, a period which you know nobody can write unless you have experienced these spiritual states. The suffering, the suffering that we see in the world and the suffering that, especially in the 19th century situation that he saw, uh, being a so very sensitive uh, human being, uh, how can God create a world in which there is so much suffering is the central question that Dostoevsky struggled for all of his life. And his contemporary, uh, in a way, Tolstoy himself, dealt with that question from another perspective, from the, from the grand history of the, uni- of the human race itself, War and Peace, for example, even the smallest detail in that novel, uh, is all linked with this fundamental question, how can human beings be so savage to, to do these things? This is not possible. If God is there, how can this continue? So the question of suffering uh, haunted both of them in, in different ways. Tolstoy reached different conclusion, Dostoevsky reached different conclusion. And the people, then the tradition actually, now that I want to use the word tradition very carefully, but the, the, the contemporary situation where individuals have searched in religious traditions for answers to, through their spiritual quest, finding none of them adequate and say, well, maybe this path of remaining in the, in the non-committal zone of not committing to every, any given religion so that you don't get the baggage of all the negative things. The problem with that is lack, is the lack of separation of what I mentioned before in beliefs, consequential ibadat, that is the acts of worship, and the ethical aspect of our being. We are, uh, we are a combination of beliefs. Our beliefs produce or bind us to a certain way of being in relation to other human beings as well as in relation to the, to the, to the God in whom, in, which, in whom we believe. And both of these then affect uh, our ethical behavior. Now, our ethical behavior can be totally independent of the belief system. People can have extremely good ethics, charity, good uh, good personal relationships, honest dealings economically, and all the rest of it. It can be without the belief in any God. Any, any person can have that. The fundamental difference comes what happens to us after we die. And we are all going to die. We see that we don't need a religious belief to tell us that we are going to die. We, we, this is a common observance that nobody is going to live forever. That is a question of supra-rational internal decision that we all reach at some point, that this life is going to come to an end, and then what, what's going to happen? Do I have another life? And if yes, what are the fundamental realities of that life? What am I going to be asked about if there is an asking? If there is a questioning after whether it gives meaning to what we do, I don't go out and steal or scale or do these things uh, and I can do it in two ways. Number one, I believe really on the ethical level that these things are wrong. I cannot just go out and steal something. This is not ethical. Or I can see or I can believe that if I did this, then this thing that I have stolen is going to come forward to me in my next life and I have to be answerable to what I did. One can exist without the other one, but both can exist together. If I believe in the second one, that is, it's unethical, number one. Number two, I'm going to be held responsible for this action in the hereafter, because I believe in the hereafter. Then I'm combining a law that is coming from beyond me, that I'm I'm attaching myself to a given religious tradition. The problem is that... uh, when we talk of a religious tradition, we get a complete package. And the packages have become so confusing, and they have become so corrupt, and they have become like, you know, even when we go for Hajj for now, you cannot go independently anymore. You cannot go to visit the house of God 
as, as an individual who is independent of the shackles that they put on you now. You stay in this hotel, you pay for this and you do this and you pay for this. All of these things were not existing before. Now, if we believe in Islam, you get a full package. If you believe in Christianity, you get a full package. But at the personal level, it is still possible to filter all of these things and get a pure core set of beliefs and not subscribe to the package. There are still ways uh, in, in, for individuals, especially in, uh, in societies where personal freedom is much more uh, available. Yes. Uh, so uh, I do want to engage with this tradition, with, with this very large segment of uh, belief system where uh, religion is taken as a package and the package is contemporary package. Uh, the, according to my uh, way of uh, looking at it and my own analysis and uh, spiritual quest, is that uh, uh, we dissociate a given certain given tradition from the package, which means we filter out, take all the shrub out, and try to go to the trunk, to the root of it, for, which means we try to penetrate the fundamental primary sources. Now, when we get to the primary sources, the problem then becomes of interpretation. What do we do with this? Well, okay, we have the Quran in the Islamic tradition, we have the Bible in the... But how do we understand it? There are two levels of that. Number one is, uh, is through the knowledge-based thing, which means we go to the, to, the, to the interpretation based on the earliest possible sources. For example, Martin Ling's book on the Sirah of the Prophet is, is one such book that opens paths through the life of the Prophet uh, for the contemporary man that was not available until that book was written, for example, because he used the primary sources and he, he connects the web of the, of the entire life uh, which is organically linked with the times as well as it transcends that time. So we try to go to the primary sources and we try to dissociate ourselves from the baggage. Number two, and this is more important than the first one, which is, first one is rational, intellectual, or going through the sources. The second is the spiritual. One of the, one of the most essential requirements of reaching any kind of spiritual certitude is to create a halwa a halwa that is a solitary inner cavity, a solitary space within our own being, in the spiritual sense, uh, into which we can, we can receive that certitude, which is supra-rational. It doesn't go through the mind, it doesn't go through the uh, rich religious tradition, it doesn't go through the, through the package itself. It is something like a light, uh, that certainly shines forth within our own being and gives us an understanding of the spiritual dimension of our existence uh, that is not linked to the package. So, inshallah, we, we can engage more yeah, on that. Which one did you want to...? I just want to, uh, you know, put before I get, you know, misunderstand later on, you know, uh, for your lectures in the beginning before you start the lecture you said that uh, you, you have done a lot of academic uh, endeavors and intellectual and you said that I don't know this is clarifying you said it is dangerous for spiritual life okay uh, related to our topic of intellectuality and spirituality uh, what do you mean by that statement okay. and it seems to me that I get the impressions that it is totally bad referring to Dr. Somali lecture, for example, that uh, he said and he believed and from the teaching of the uh, prophets and the imams that when the times moving into that our times becoming better, mm. you know, before comings of Al Mahdi. Mm. You know, so and uh, it seems to me that uh, it is important you to distinguish what do you mean by modernity and you related you're talking a lot about spirituality but uh, I don't think that the case that happens in the Western society is applicable and the same what happens in the eastern part of the world especially like in my place my country like we uh, most of 
we, we can say that we are very spiritual, but not rational. You know, we are talking going back to spirituality, spirituality. Even that we we live in that traditions. We believe even that the water is alive and it has soul. So we have to touch with it gentle and we pray to the water before we take our children to the shower, for example. And we pray at night and we believe that the unity between earth and you know here and after after uh, after death you know and for example my mother always say there is no that dunya and akhirah this is the same it is one right and it is not that we uh, live now and then uh, what is it and okay that we can be suffer here and later on we are going to be happy we have to be happy now. If we are happy now, so we are happy, happy in afterlife. So, but the religions of Islam, you know, taking that to dichotomy between men and women, dunya and akhirah. But generally, we live in Indonesia. We have a lot of the traditions and ethnic groups. We live in that tradition, but we are lack of rationality. So, I want you to clarify within our team, intellectual and spirituality, what do you mean? Very good. So, and um, y you, are, you, you said you, which religious studies you follow? The majority is Muslim, so we, we, we have most 500. Uh, I mean, uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, more than 500 ethnic groups. In no, I know yourself. No, Muslims. You are Muslims. No, I just wanted to ask so that I can respond um, to you personally. Uh, let me first clarify the first point. Um, intellectual, intellectuality or intellect, as I mentioned before, is a very misused word. So in the sense of an academic discourse uh, that has uh, a limited use of uh, examining existing data for the sake of examining the various positions. Uh, like is uh, in the Western University system, for example, a professor of philosophy in ethics, for example, can uh, come to lecture day after day on ethics and go home and uh, live a very unethical life. There is no, no problem with that in the academy. He can discuss ethics all his life. He can discuss the highest levels of ethics and the works, etc. But that's his job that he does. It has no applicability in his personal life. So in that sense, uh, intellectual discourse remaining a barren uh, spiritual exercise. Uh, my statement was in, in relation to that kind of discussion, that kind of knowledge that has no reality in existence for the people who are involved in the creation of that knowledge. Um, in the kind of discussions and the kind of sessions I aspire to have, it is deeply intellectual in the sense that we want to engage with the intellect in the highest sense. We want to in engage with the uh, tradition of knowledge. We want to bring in concepts and ideas and uh, search into knowledge, but with the intention and the conscious effort of benefiting spiritually in our own understanding of who we are, what is our relationship with the world, what is our relationship with the Creator, what is, our, what is it that we are doing here, why are we here? To benefit to integrate, to know, to practice, to learn, to integrate within our own beings what we know, so that the knowledge does not remain an external reality for us. It becomes experiential reality. So that's my explanation for that, for the first one. Uh, the second aspect that you mentioned uh, is, is in fact, uh, is, is one of the major things I want to focus on. I do believe that uh, there is a temporal manifestation of the chaos in the human race itself. As we go away 
from the sources of knowledge and tazkiya, which is purification. We continuously go down and uh, the proof text, again, uh, because I, that's why I asked you if you are a Muslim, because otherwise I'll have to spend a lot of time to use a different set of arguments. But because um, you said you are a Muslim, uh, you believe that the word of God himself is al-haq, is the truth. You believe the Quran to be the, ex the actual speech, Kalamullah, the, the actual words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you believe that uh, if something can be verified back to the Prophet Islam, then that is truth. We don't need to argue against it. Is that clear? We believe what the Quran says is truth. We believe that if something can be traced back authentically, to the Prophet that's truth as well. So we believe in the, in the received truth that may or may not agree with what we think, but we, when God says something, of course he has more knowledge to us. The Quran very clearly points out, and also the Ahadith very clearly point out, that each successive day that arrives on this world, each successive day that comes is worse than the previous day. It's a totally anti-evolutionary, anti-progress narrative in the Quran. And this is one of the greatest, greatest intellectual and spiritual misunderstandings of modernity, that we are progressing, we are going, we are becoming better and better with time. Every single day that comes is better than yesterday. Therefore, the previous generations who lived before, they were less developed than us. They were ignorant than us, which means the companions of the Prophet <laughs> had less knowledge of the Quran than we do because now we have science and technology and we have all the rest. Now, the proof text for that, and this please try to understand, this is a very fundamental misunderstanding. The proof text for that is Surah al Waqiyah. Surah al Waqiyah clearly defines what's going to happen to the humanity, divide it into three groups. And you will recall, you will recall that the muqarribun, qleelun min al akhirin they will be less from the people of the later times. The muqarribin is the highest level. Ashab al-shimal wa ashab al-yameel. Ashab al yameen people of the right, people of the left, and then the third category of those brought nearer to God. This is a very, very special category. And it is said in, the, in Surah Al-Waqiyah that most of them from the, will be from the Avalin, from the people who came before. I have, and, and, and because this is such a major thing, I'm going to go deeper into it uh, tomorrow, inshallah, uh, quoting the ahadith of the Prophet Wasallam about the time itself that the time has a quantitative, uh, sorry, a qualitative decrease. Each day that comes is less in the spiritual worth than the next day. And this is exactly where we stop actually, this temporal direction. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just actually touch on it so that I answer your uh, your question as well as that will take prepare us for tomorrow. I will go more deeply into this uh, uh, into this metaphor that is both in uh, in the Bible as well as in the hadith of the Prophet So uh, this is where we will inshallah stop with this uh, parable. The parable in the Bible uh, goes like this. This is in uh, in Matthews. So, a man, for the kingdom of heavens is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So a man goes out and he hires laborers.